Oh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Live Stories Worldwide on a Monday evening, going out on Zoom, on uh, YouTube, and on Facebook. Can I encourage you to uh, let your friends know about this uh, broadcast that's going out tonight? We have a wonderful speaker who's going to be interviewed by George, our Live Stories Worldwide interviewer. And uh, if you have any questions tonight, any problems, Will you please contact us on the Life Stories hotline? You've got the number on your screen. It is 07943-550-287. Or if you're um, in another country, it's plus 44-7943-550-287. That is our dedicated prayer hotline. At the end, if you have any questions, then George will be willing to take those questions and you can send them on your post on YouTube or on Zoom. But uh, tonight, as I said, we have a wonderful speaker, uh, Simon Thomas, a, a broadcaster and writer. Uh, Simon has been involved in highly successful broadcasting with BBC and Sky for over 20 years. He began his broadcasting career in 1999 with the children's program Blue Peter on BBC. And uh, he has a lot of wonderful things to share, how things have happened in his life, which have caused him to realize God is good. So right now, I'm going to hand over to George and Simon to do this program. Over to you, George and Simon. Thank you so much, Alan, and welcome, Simon. You're looking very well, I must say. <laughs> In fact, you're looking, you don't have to go back on Blue Peter. <laughs> now, you do realize, of course, you do realize, of course, that coming on here, you're really going to be famous from us. You won't be able to go to shopping. <laughs> well, welcome to um, our Zoom meeting. And uh, as you know, on these meetings, we just talk to people about their lives and how God has uh, impacted their lives and just a bit about themselves, of course. I mean, we know everybody knows from reading Wikipedia right, about you that, you know, your life, you had broadcasting very. A good career but tell us how it all began I mean what was your upbringing like and you know where you came from originally so I I grew up the son of a vicar um my dad was a Church of England vicar so we were we were a Norfolk based family for the first 10 years of life and then I headed down to Surrey where dad took over a church there and then I think tv wise broadcasting wise the I, I I watched Blue Peter as a kid loved it just thought it was just a, an amazing program for the adventure and I often used to sit there and think that would be an amazing program to work on but I never ever thought at that stage that I'd one day end up working on it but it was really at university so I went to Birmingham University to study history media studies as a course there are hundreds of media studies courses out there now but back in 1992 there were very few so a little bit of advice from someone called Jeremy Vine, whose family used to worship at my dad's church. And he was in Radio 4 at the time. Of course, now he's on Radio 2 and does lots of other stuff. But he just said, just get a degree. And if you can get experience at university and broadcasting, do that. So we had an internal TV station at Birmingham University called Guild TV. Nobody watched it. Literally nobody watched it. It was on in all the bars in the various uh, clubs in the Guild. And I started doing a program on a Friday just called The Lunchbox. It was a fun magazine show, hour long with one other presenter. But the amazing thing was, is that they they got a lot of secondhand TV equipment from a studio down the road called Pebble Mill. Now, some of you of a certain generation will remember Pebble Mill. It's yeah. where all the BBC's morning output used to come from. So over the years, they'd amassed all this secondhand equipment. So we had a proper studio, three cameras, and it got you used to what it's actually like to do live TV, to have someone chatting in your ear while you're talking. And yeah, no one's watching it. But actually, I caught the bug. And as I came to leave university, someone said, you know, you really should try this for a job. And so I came out of university and to cut a very long story short, but I, I aimed for Blue Peter and I gave myself three and a half years. I remember from a Christian point of view, a really vivid moment. I was back in Beckles where my parents were living at the time they'd moved from from Surrey to Suffolk and that was dad's last church before he retired and I remember one afternoon I was sat there thinking is, th is this just a dream that I'm going to chase or is God in this and I always think as a Christian it's, it's always quite a good idea to involve God in big decisions 
so I prayed about it that afternoon. And I sort of thought I'm just going to be really bold and said, God, just give me a sign that I'm not about to waste the next three years of my life chasing a dream that's never going to come to fruition. So I said my prayer. And then a, a while later, I went down to my dad's study at a desk, a little bit like where I'm sat now. And I was about to start writing letters on his computer to lots of different production companies, to Blue Peter and other programs to try and get some work experience, try and get a running job. And I just noticed this magazine, uh, and I think it was called the Alpha Magazine, but I don't think it was actually connected to what we now know as the Alpha course. And on the front cover, one of the sub headlines of the articles inside was why we need more Christians in the media. I was like, goodness me. So I opened this magazine and it'd been actually written by a guy called Steve Chalk and Pam Rhodes, who was presenting on BBC Songs of Praise at the time. And it was like one of those moments where I don't know if you've sat in church or at a Christian event, wherever it might be, when someone does a talk and you occasionally get those moments where it feels like that talk is just being aimed at you. And it was like this article had just been written to me. And it was why we need more Christians in the mainstream media. It's OK having magazines and Christian radio stations, but we also need Christians in the mainstream media. And I just thought that's my answer. So for the next three years, I chased it down. I tried uh, applied for the job two times, got absolutely nowhere, got that letter that comes back, says, keep your details on file. Anybody who knows anything about TV knows that's a no, just a polite way of putting it. And then in 1999, um, through unfortunate circumstances for him, one of their presenters, Richard Bacon, got sacked in very famous circumstances. I remember it well, actually. <laughs> yeah, and, and there was an opening. And I thought, this is it. I'm going to give it one last roll of the dice. I'm going to try one final time. And, and after a long process of an interview and then eventually an audition, uh, I got the job. So that, that in a nutshell is how I went from being a little boy growing up in Norfolk to becoming Blue Peter's 27th presenter. I mean, you said yourself, you know, that Blue Peter was iconic and everybody wants to be on it and do things on it. I mean, did you ever dream when you were going to school and a kid that you would actually do it? No, 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 no. I just thought I used to watch it and think that would be an amazing thing to do for a job, you know, to, to get paid to, to travel the world, to try a lot of different experiences that people either pay very, very good money for or will never get the chance to do. And that was your daily life. You know, you never knowing from one week to the next. Yes, you knew what, when you were in the studio, what the live shows were. But in terms of films, not never quite knowing what the next week was going to bring. And it could mean suddenly a, a trip abroad out of the blue. I remember getting to the end of a summer holiday a few years ago. I knew already I was going to Belize uh, to dive something called, called the Blue Hole. So I was very excited about that trip. You know, as going back to work in September goes, a trip to Belize isn't bad. And then literally... <laughs> A day later, as I was getting ready for this filming trip in, in 10 days time, there's, look, there's a new film coming out made by Pixar called Finding Nemo. And it's all about this fish that lives on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And we want to do a whole film on it. So you're the only presenter who can dive. So would you mind going to Australia before you go to Belize? So two days later, you're getting on a plane to go and dive the Barrier Reef for three days. That, that is just, that's the dream job, which is why so many people wanted to do it. Very exciting. And um, before you landed the Blue Peter job, did you have a plan B? I mean, was there a career path uh, you had in mind that you wanted to be maybe an engineer or a, a teacher or something like that? That's a or very maybe, good question. Because, or maybe go into ministry after you uh, Yeah, I've, I've had that mentioned a few times, but I definitely think it's it's a calling, not not following the family trade. So I haven't I haven't felt that call yet. Um, no, the honest answer is I didn't I didn't have a firm plan B. Um, so I've often wondered, well, what would life have looked like had that moment in 99 not come about? You know, the question of what would have happened is one in life that we can ask ourselves many times, because ultimately, as C.S. Lewis says in, in the Chronicles of Narnia, and Aslan used to say, the, the story of what would have happened has never, ever been told. So ultimately, I don't know. I mean, I worked in Selfridges for two years after coming out of university to pay the bills whilst trying to get media experience. I don't think I'd have ended up at Selfridges long term. Um, I mean, I nearly went for the police force, but uh, due to a dodgy knee, didn't get anywhere. So, George, the honest answer is I have no idea what I'd have done if this hadn't worked out. Hey, good. Thing is, of course, on Blue Peter and uh, you've landed the iconic. How did you actually feel when you got the words that you've got the job? Uh, without doubt, the most exciting but surreal moment ever in, in life. So I'm, I'm sure there's some people watching this from, from elsewhere who are probably thinking, what? Well, I don't understand this programme at all. But it's, it's been on air for 60 years and it's, it's, uh, it's an iconic, as you mentioned, BBC show. And when you get the job, I remember walking out as she was the head of children's at the BBC at the time. And this appointment was really important because of what had happened to Richard Bacon. 
there was always going to be a lot of media interest in who was going to replace the guy who's got sacked for taking cocaine. And they wanted to get it right. So it was a very long process. But I remember that night and she cracked open a bottle of champagne. I had a, a glass of champagne with her and the editor of the programme. And then I was told you can't tell anybody for the next three weeks because we want to try and protect you and your family. So just please only tell your close family. But as I walked out her office, there on the wall is all the pictures of the 26 previous presenters. And he kind of looked at it and thought, I've just joined the most exclusive club in the land. I'm the 27th member. There's never been any more than 27. Uh, and that's, that's just a really surreal moment. I remember standing at, um, at the tube station in Wood Lane, just outside the BBC and thinking, I can't really tell anybody, but this is gonna change my life. It really is gonna change everything. And it was, yeah, without doubt, the most surreal and exciting moment of life thus far. Did you think at that point, wow, I've made it, I've made the BBC? Yeah, I did a little bit. I remember sort of looking as I walked out of Television Centre, um, as it was then, obviously it's, it's changed now, but um, just looking behind me and on the side of, it's a very famous logo that people had seen on the side of the building, which is Studio One, this huge studio where I did my audition, and just seeing BBC Television Centre, as I sort of looked back and thought, Crocky, that's now my office, that's where I'm going to be working. And, you know, for so long, it felt like those gates would never be prized open, that I'd never be someone walking in with the, the lanyard and the, and, the, and the little pass that says BBC with your photo on it, which a lot of people, if I'm honest, used to wear with great pride on the tube, just to let everyone know, sitting around them, that they worked for the BBC. But yes, it was a, a magnificent moment to think, crikey, I've just become a, a BBC presenter. Now, you got the job, OK? You're the new kid on the block. And um, how did the other presenters, um, you know, welcome you when you came along? I think looking back on it, not just for the presenters, but for everyone working in the show, it was quite a strange time. I think everybody knew that really the BBC had no choice but to terminate Richard Bacon's contract. Mm -hmm. you know, but he was a very, very popular presenter, not just with the viewers, but also with the people who worked on the show, the other presenters and the production staff, a really popular figure. He's a, he's a really, he's a, he's a fun character. He's, he's great company. I've met him you know, many times down the years. So th there was, because this was probably, I, I got the job probably about a month and a half after he'd gone. Um, and there was, a, there was a little bit of a sense in which people were still kind of mourning his, his loss. You know, they, they didn't really want to be having to welcome a new presenter in, but here I was, I've just been given this amazing opportunity and I think for a time, and not saying people were unfriendly, they were, but I could, I could really sense that there was, there was still a lot of people upset by what had happened to Richard and it weren't quite in the place yet where they were ready to sort of welcome with huge open arms a new presenter, but they knew they needed one because it, the show's on air three times a week. You're making films every week. You, you know, it's too much work for three of them. So I think the presenters were relieved I'd arrived because I'll take on some of the work, but the production stuff, they, they took a little bit of time to warm up to me, which, which was difficult because, you know, it's one of those sliding doors moments in life, isn't it? You've been given an opportunity by what's happened and, and you've got to take it. You're never going to say no, but it was, a, it was an unusual time to get it. Now you've joined the program, of course, and uh, we only ever see the finished pro um, process on telly and TV. You all look great. You're all great and friendly. Was there ever any tension behind the scenes where, like, I think I should be doing such and such, or you know, I should have that job. Uh, I'm better at that and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, listen, there's always a little bit of that because you know it's something I was always always determined to do, and that was not let a job like that change me as a person. I didn't want to be seduced by fame or or any of the trappings that come with with doing a very public job so that kind of side didn't interest me and I, I it meant a lot to me when people said you you haven't changed at all you know between when you joined the show and when you left you're still the same Simon so I always felt it was really important to treat everybody as, as your equal whether they're the camera person the sound man whoever it is we're a team we I always used to describe us like we're like a football team the presenters are the finishers they're the strikers they're the ones who like in a game of football get the glory but without all the men behind them in a, in a football team you're nothing and it was the same for us so I was always really conscious of of being appreciative of, of being in a team. Um, but you know, there, yeah, there's always going to be, there's always going to be little stressful moments. They'd, they'd often come on summer trips because you'd be away filming for five weeks in some really amazing locations, but five weeks filming in India, which is just incredibly hot and humid. 
and you're on the go pretty much every day. You don't really get any days off. Uh, you know, when, when people get tired, then, then people get a bit, a bit upset with each other. I remember going on a trip to San Francisco uh, and Matt Baker, who I worked with for many years, it was me and Matt doing San Francisco and, and we did a few independent films and then we did some filming together. And there was one iconic shot in this film, which was Matt and I driving a red Corvette Wow. Uh, soft top with the roof down over the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, just an amazing moment. And Richard, the director, said Simon's going to be driving. And I only heard later on, because he didn't say this in front of me, that Matt wasn't very happy that he wasn't driving. You know, There's a bit of male testosterone, a bit of egos going on. So he wanted to drive. But yeah, you, you listen, when there's a team of four of you, you're always going to get moments like that. But I think the reason why the period I was on, it was so such a good time to be part of the show because we were genuinely friends you know we weren't we didn't just put it on for the for the cameras at five o'clock on a monday afternoon we we socialized together uh, and are still friends to this day now you mentioned earlier about your dad of course with the vicar and uh, hmm. somebody mentioned to you but they need more christians in media when you went into the job did you have that in your mind as well uh, to be a christian in the media to bring them the, the gospel message with you yes that's a good it's a good question because that that I found quite difficult at first because, because there was an awful lot of publicity about me getting the job because of what had come before. I think the media made a lot of the fact that I was a vicar's son and also that I was a Christian because they're looking at it and going, you couldn't get a, a safer bet than going for a vicar's son. Little do they know about many other vicar's sons who haven't gone the same way, but they, they kind of, they, they painted me as this kind of Christian goody two shoes, you know, not going to make the same mistake as Richard Bacon. And I, I did feel quite a lot of expectation from the UK Christian world because I, you get so many emails and letters and requests to visit churches or visit the youth events and, you know, and people saying we're praying for you regularly and all those kind of things, which was lovely. But I'd always be, you know, and some people would write as directly as to say, we really look forward to you sharing your faith on, on, on Blue Peter. Now, there were one or two films I did where I did speak about my faith because it fitted in with what we were doing. But, you know, how, how do you share your faith on a TV programme? You can't sort of come on air at five o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon and go, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Blue Peter. And just while we're here, let me just tell you, God loves you and he's died for you and he's forgiven your sins. Amen. Right. Later on the programme, we've got to make, you know, you can't, you'd lose your job. So it was quite hard, that kind of expectation that, that, that suddenly we were able, we've got this Christian on a, on a high profile show and lots has been talked about him in the press about the fact he's a Christian that I felt, I did feel a lot of pressure actually, that, that I was supposed to use this position, but actually I felt being a Christian was more about, as it always should be, about your actions and your words and, and how you conduct yourself, not whether you open your mouth live on the television and, and, and declare God's forgiveness for everybody. And how did you actually cope with that pressure at the time? Um, I think I just got better at knowing what to say yes to and what to say no to. You, you kind of feel, oh, I need to go and do that. And I, 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 there was definitely a period, George, where I felt, I felt I was just, you know, it, it was another Christian event I was going to that weekend or the next week. And, and, and I thought people eventually, they're going to get bored of hearing, you know, of Simon Thomas always popping up at any particularly youth event. So I became much better at going, that's really worth doing. But actually these others, you know, just for my own well-being and actually to manage my time and to have actually some time to yourself, you know, in a show that demands so much of you. Uh, I just became good at kind of filtering out what was worth doing and no offence to them, but wasn't, you know, wasn't so worth doing. Um, yeah. And how did you manage to keep your feet on the ground? I just see you didn't let the fame get to you. How did you manage to keep your feet on the ground and keep grounded? Well, I kept the same set of friends. My friends didn't change. They were always good, very good at keeping me grounded. Um, and I think it's seeing, seeing the job for what it is. It's an incredibly privileged job to do, uh, a wonderful job to do, but it's just a TV programme at the end of the day. And we're not, we're not saving lives. We're, we're just trying to give kids a bit of constructive programming three times a week, try and inspire them, try and educate them, entertain them, but we're not lifesavers. So it was, it was seeing it for what it was and actually realizing very early on, I'd, I'd say the whole fame angle probably interested me for about six months. And after that, I just thought it's something so, so hollow about it, you know, because you, you come away from a conversation where someone stopped you in the street and you realize they're not really asking anything about you. It's the fact that you're the guy they see on the telly. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and it's, it's, it, I can see, and I know why fame is so seductive, but actually when you get it, it's actually a very empty thing that, that leaves far more questions than it ever answers. Now you said you had this uh, great expectation of a weight on your shoulders going into a Brother Peter as a Christian and it was, you know, there's plenty in the media. Um, just tell us a little bit about how you yourself became a Christian. Like, you know, you said your dad was a vicar, but how did it actually happen for you to become a Christian? Well, I, I mean, I obviously grew up in, in, in a Christian household, you know, so God was part of life and, and church was part of life. A lot of my best friends throughout all of my youth went to church so I, I really enjoyed going to church you know I enjoyed going to see my friends and I knew it meant a lot for dad to have his family there particularly when you get to that age where you can decide to opt out you get into your teens and yeah. it's like well I'm, I'm going to sleep in today or I'm not going to go this week you know I know I know from for him it, it gave him a, you know it made him proud when when he had all his all of his family there but yeah you get to that you get to that point in in life where you begin to question things but I I often tell this story um, not just because it's dramatic, but really it was the, it was a seminal moment for me in going, do you know what, I, I actually, this, this God that I hear about on a Sunday, he, it's, he's real. And we, we were living in a, a small village in Grimston, called Grimston in West Norfolk at the time. And I was seven years of age. And it'd been one of those Saturday mornings where it just rained all morning. We were going stir crazy. Dad had been out at meetings and I had two sisters. So we've got two sisters, Becky and Hannah. Uh, Becky was six and Hannah was, was, was not even one at this point. And we got to sort of lunchtime and, and the clouds cleared and the sun began to come out. And Dad said, look, let's just, let's just get, let's get out. Let's go for a walk. So we drove to some woods near where we live and went for a walk. And we were going down this big clearing in the middle of these woods. It's essentially just a massive pine forest, but there's other trees in there as well. And I'm at the age where if a tree's climbable, I was going up it. And we got to this really big kind of yew tree and Thomas, sure enough, scampers up it and starts playing around. And then eventually I came and sat down with my legs dangling like this in the kind of yew bit. And my, my dad was sort of stood here. I remember my sister Becky stood there. My mum was holding Hannah just in front and it started to rain again. And mum said, look, I, I think we should move to the other side of the clearing to get shelter. And we sort of looked at her like she was slightly barking mad because we were already being very nicely sheltered by this tree. And about half a minute later, she said it again. She said, no, I really do think we should move across the clearing to the other side. And again, mum's dad sort of said, oh, Jill, come on, you don't think we don't need to move. And then I, when I can still, and this is, this is 41 years later, I can still see the look in her eye when she looked at me and dad and said, I really do think we need to move now. So to keep, keep the peace, dad said, look, come on, son, get down from the tree and let's move over to the other side, keep your mum happy. So over we went. And I would say probably 20 seconds later, as we get over the other side, it was like the, the roar of a tornado jet coming through the woods, incredible sound. And I remember looking up and just seeing this kind of, it was like a, just like a tunnel of fire above our heads. And there was this almighty explosion. We can't see anything for the smoke. And then this huge thud. Um, and as we looked as the smoke cleared, the tree where I'd been sat not a minute ago had been blown apart by lightning. Wow. And we haired it back to the car and we're in tears and, you know, very traumatized. And later that evening, some friends of ours, and I wish I'd got it to show you because, um, it's an amazing picture. I've still got it. I just don't know where it is because we moved house a few weeks ago. But we went back that evening with a friend of ours, a very good photographer, and just to see the tree. And I've got a picture of this shattered tree. Uh, and some very good friends of our mum and dad were there. And Rosemary, who was a Christian as well, said to mum, she said, why, why did you move? Because the story, when you hear it, doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And mum just said, I just heard, I just heard this voice saying move. And I really do believe that that was God. And actually, many, many years later, I was at a big Christian event and this guy just came to pray for me and he knew nothing about me. I wasn't on Blue Peach at this time. And he just said to me, he said, I've got a really strong feeling that around the age of seven, you had an experience that really demonstrated very powerfully that God is real. So I often look back when, you, when I've gone through things that have tested my faith, made me question God's character. I look back to that day and go, that's the day for me when God made himself feel very real. Excellent. Fantastic story. Now, of course, Blue Peter wouldn't be Blue Peter without the badge. Have you got the badge with you, Simon? <laughs> wait there. I literally okay. just wait there. We have to see the badge. <laughs> I may have one. <laughs>
Well done, George. This is the first time I've ever done this. Live on, I'm sorry everybody for disappearing, but it, this is gonna be worth it, okay? This is not, this is not just a badge. Yeah, no, I read about this, this badge, yes. This is the one I was given on the day I left, so there's the box. Yep. And inside is one of these. Wow. Hey, you got that? There you the go, box. ladies and gentlemen, a gold Blue Peter badge. Wow. Hey, you got that presented to you, of course, by Her Majesty herself. Well, no, I, I know I presented the Queen with the bat. With oh, the I see. Badge. Yeah, yeah. What, she... was what was that like? It's, well, actually, it's funny enough. I was talking about this yesterday with Ethan, my boy, because uh, he said, "What was what was it like to meet the Queen?" Um, and I said, "It's it's a really surreal moment because I, I'm betting there's probably no one on this on this Zoom evening who's older than the Queen. So for all of us, I think I can fairly <laughs> safely say you haven't met Ellen, obviously." <laughs> <laughs> That she's been an ever present in all of our lives, you yes. know, whether whether you're a royalist or you're not, she has been there throughout all of our lives. So when she walks into the studio that day, and it's part of her Golden Jubilee celebration, so they were visiting her and the Duke of Edinburgh at various British institutions. I think he'd gone to British Airways that day, and the Queen was coming to visit BBC Television Centre and was looking. She was going to see two shows. One was BBC News, and the other was ours. So. We had this long lineup in the studio of past presenters. So Valerie Singleton and Peter Purvis were there. Former editors, like the famous editor, Biddy Baxter. Lots of people who've been involved both now and before were in the studio. So there's a huge long lineup. And my boss said, look, we, we want you, Simon, at the end of the, of the line to be the one who gives the Queen the Gold Blue Peter badge, basically because we think you're the one least likely to mess it up. So I said, OK. Um, so about an hour before the Queen arrived, this her press secretary came into the studio and we were all lined up and she came along to each of us and said, what are you going to say to the Queen? And she also told us the, what you do in terms of, you know, right language and bowing and all those kind of things. And I said, well, I'm going to do a gag. And she said, well, Queen doesn't do gags. And I told her what I was going to say, she said, you cannot say that. I'm going to come back in five minutes and I'll let you know what you can, you know, give me something else. Anyway, she came back about five minutes later. She said, look, if you stick to those words, you can say the joke. I went, okay. So anyway, so eventually in comes the queen and it's like you feel you know her because she's been an ever present. It's like for a moment you think it's like your grandma's just walked in and then you go, oh my goodness me, it's the, it's the queen. But when she stands in front of you, it, it is quite a moment. And so I just stood there with this a blue box exactly like this. And I just said, Your Majesty, uh, on behalf of the programme, I'd like to award you with the programme's highest honour. It's a gold blue Peter badge and Your Majesty may be interested to know you can get into the Tower of London free with this. And the Queen, <laughs> the Queen laughed and off she went. She went, how lovely. And she was gone. And afterwards, I was interviewed by lots of different news channels saying, how did you make the Queen laugh? It's like no one had ever made a laugh before, which of course they have. Um, but yeah, that was, an, that was an amazing moment. Amazing moment. Fantastic. What a what an end to your career, of course, because um, following the the BBC, you jumped across to Sky Sports. Was that a big mm. wrench for you? No, I mean, yeah, it's a wrench to leave a, a show like that. But you know, when you get the job, that your your lifespan on it is not a job for life. You know, you're going to be on there. Probably most presenters average around five six years. So I knew probably six years would be about the time this. The thing about the show is it's an amazing show to work on, but it, it demands an awful lot of your life. You know, you, you are essentially theirs for those six six years. And yeah, there's lots of things socially, life events I missed out on because we would be away filming or something. So that's kind of the only real downside of the job. And I think there comes a time where if you're not careful, you can stay too long and begin to fall out of love with it. And I always wanted to go while I still loved it, to go on a high. And that's that's a hard way to leave. But I think it's the best way because then you are just left with happy memories. I mean, I won't say their names, but there have been presenters down the years who have stayed too long. They fell out of love with the programme and became quite bitter about their experiences of it. And it was no one else's fault. It's just they stayed too long. Yeah. And I felt it was just important to go out on a high. So I always said to myself, five to six years. And then my next ambition was to get into the world of sport. Now, before we just finish with uh, Blue Peter, one last thing I wanted to ask you about, Blue Peter. Of all the things you've done, like the sky dives, the mountain climbing, what was the most um, exhilarating thing you ever did for Blue Peter? 
Very good question. I think the most exhilarating would be would be the skydiving because it, it became a it became a lot harder than I ever envisaged it. I've never had an issue with heights, and I'd always I've made it clear to the program quite early on. You know, when the time came to do another parachuting film, because they've done quite a few down the years, I'd love to do it. Mm-hmm. And so we were going to make a film where I would go out to San Diego because it's where the RAF Falcons do all their winter training because it's blue skies every day. And I would learn to free fall parachute jump with them. And then the idea was the next summer back at the UK at one of the one of the big air shows, I would do a a skydive with the Falcons, a display with them. Mm-hmm. So out to San Diego we went and it's you know just hugely exciting. Um and I think it was probably about jump number five. So we've done four jumps. And and when you start off learning to free fall, you you jump out the plane with, with an instructor either side of you. So you've got all these red suits that's got these ribbed things along the side so they can hold on to you. So they're trying to get your body position right as you drop. Because once you're once you're stable, then you can begin to maneuver yourself in the air. Uh, and they stay with you until the moment you pull your parachute and then they keep dropping you a little bit further and then open theirs. Um, so everything had been going fine. I think we got to jump number five and down we go. You're dropping at 120 miles per hour over San Diego, over the hills. And I pulled my chutes at five and a half thousand feet, which is the, the level I was supposed to pull it at. And it it felt a lot longer than it was, but it was still quite a significant amount of time. Nothing happens. I remember as we're dropping, I can sort of sense this punch on the back, which is coming from Roger and Toby, the two instructors. And eventually, thankfully, I mean, you've got a reserve chute, of course, but the thing came out and up it went and, and everything was fine. But as, as we did after every jump, they would sit down with you because we've got a cameraman coming down with us who's filming it as he skydives. And we looked back at the jump. And to my horror, I, I see the moment that I pull the chute and I'm just watching, as I suspected, Roger and Toby literally thumping this backpack to get this chute out. And at that point, my bottle totally, totally went. And um, I'll tell this one story because I think from a, from a Christian point of view, this is, was an amazing moment. So what happened is that particular trip became a bit of a disaster. I think I managed four jumps more and I couldn't do it anymore. Just It was just every time I went into a plane, just, you know, the, the fear levels were just too much to handle. So in the end, they said, look, we're going to have to call it a day and maybe, maybe come back again some other time and try it. So I went and did a few jumps back in the UK that that next spring, got my bottle back. And I, I managed to persuade the program to fly me out to San Diego again to do a film about conquering fear, because that's quite a powerful thing. You know, the first film had been a very honest film about how difficult it was and, and how I couldn't overcome my fears. And I thought, well, let's make the next film about the journey to overcoming fear. So back we went and I thought it was going to be fine, but we're staying in exactly the same hotel as the year before. So you walk in, you know how sights and sounds and smells stir up memories. And it's like, oh, no, I'm back. And all those fears from 18 months before began to come back. I had this utterly sleepless night. I couldn't stop thinking. And actually the question in my head going again and again and again was, if these two bits of material that are going to be strapped to my back tomorrow both fail, which is highly, highly, highly unlikely, you, you, you're safer doing a parachute jump than you are driving in your car. That's the reality. But it was causing me to think, you know, if, if that did happen, is this God I follow? Is he actually real? Because I'm going to find out. I'm maybe going to find out tomorrow if it all goes horribly wrong, whether this God I believe in is actually real or not. So I couldn't sleep. And I sat down with my director the next day, same director from the time before. And he looks at me and said, you look awful. What's happened? I said, no, it's fine. It's fine. Anyway, I rang up a very close Christian friend of mine. He's a guy called Phil Wall. He's worked for the Salvation Army for many, many years. Uh, and he's become a real mentor for me. And he said, look, anytime you want to chat, he knew I was quite worried about the trip. So just give us a shout and I'll pray, even if it's the middle of the night. So before we went to get in the minibus to drive to the drop zone, I gave Phil a, a ring. And I just said, mate, I am really struggling. Um, I don't think I can jump. And I've just got the program to bring me out again. I'm going to waste all their money. But I, I've got palpitations. I'm sweating. I don't want to go anywhere near an aeroplane today. And he just said, mate, I know. He said, just let me pray for you. He said, just let me pray for you right now. Because I told him about the mental screw of what if everything fails and I find out that this this faith that I have isn't real. It isn't true. And he said, let me pray for you. And he said, I just remember the prayer so clearly. He just said, and I was standing outside the hotel. He said, God, I pray right now that God 
that you, God, would just give Simon a real tangible reminder that he and you are real and give him the confidence to go to that airfield today and jump. Amen. So I said, thanks, mate. Put the phone down. And I thought it'd be nice to get some of the RAF guys coming to the drop zone, some donuts, some Dunkin' Donuts, which was just opposite. So I thought, yeah. I'll just pop over there, get a box of donuts, get the boys G'd up. I didn't feel any better, by the way, from Phil's prayer. It was nice, but I didn't suddenly feel no fear anymore. And as I was just about to walk back over the road to the hotel, I was waiting for the green man. You can't do what we do here and, and go when the man's not green. And as I was waiting, I felt this tap on my shoulder and I looked around. There's this young guy, I can still see him now, blonde hair. And he just looked at me. He doesn't know me from Adam. He just said, I want you to know that Jesus is real. Wow. And, you. and I sort of looked back and then I looked again and he'd gone. I, I literally, he'd either vanished into thin air or he'd found an alleyway that I cannot see. And, you know, I, I firmly believe that God does appoint angels like that yeah. sometimes in life. And I believe that that day God said, look, I am real because I went to the jump zone. The first jump was amazing. And by the end of that week, I'd passed the course. I'd done over 50 jumps. I was jumping out of an airplane in shorts and T-shirts and doing spins in the air and everything. I passed the course. So it was a triumphant film. But the start point of the triumph and the overcoming of the fear was God actually very powerfully, tangibly reminding me that actually he is for real. Were you able to convey that in the film? Have you overcame your fear that it was God who helped you through that? Were you able to convey that in the film? No, that's, it, that's, that's where I think the difficulty of talking about your faith in a public job comes in, because that, that, that story in itself, you know, a lot of people would go, why, why is that important to the film? You know, if they don't have a faith, they'd question it. And then the BBC have got to tread this careful line of not looking like they're just favouring one faith over the other. So I've told it many times in sort of public spheres, but I've never, you know, just didn't sit within the film. I mean, I think I went as far as saying, you know, I said my prayers last night, but not the story of this, <laughs> this guy appearing out of nowhere on the streets of San Diego. Now you mentioned prayer, of course, and your friend Phil prayed for you. How important is prayer to you in your life today? Well, it's really important. You know, at the moment for all of us, we're going through a, a continually difficult time and um, myself and, and Ethan and Darina uh, moved a few weeks ago, but for quite some time, it didn't look like this house move was going to come off. It was hugely stressful. And we, we got into the habit of doing this thing called seven, seven in seven. So what we decided to do is put a reminder on our phone at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. every day to pray about some of these issues. And one of the issues is also Ethan finding a secondary school, which at the moment he, he's due to start at a new school in September, but currently doesn't have one because of, of just moving. So we try and get into the habit. Sometimes we're better than others, but we, we're trying to get back into it again, of taking those things that need prayer, praying for, that we need God's guidance with, and we need his help on, in just remembering to do that twice a day at seven o'clock. And we, we find it really helpful. And it's, it's, it's a discipline as well, isn't it? You know, prayer yes, it's about flexing that muscle, it's about muscle memory. So that's, that's something we do. So, you know, it's hugely important. You know, it underpins who we are as people. That's a very good tip. Now, of course, you moved on to Sky Sports, uh, a whole new ball game, shall we say. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did you move in there with trepidation? What did you expect when you went in there? What was it like? Yeah, there was, there was a little bit of trepidation, George, because you kind of got to prove yourself again. You've come from a kids program and now you're in the macho world of sports. And I think there were one or two um, who were a little bit curious as to why Blue Peter was entered, just turned up at Sky Sports. Uh, one or two were, I'd say, a little bit cynical about whether I could do it. But I, I went into it with my eyes wide open. I knew that I had the raw skills broadcasting wise, as in I can talk to a camera, I know all the technical terms. So I don't have to worry about that. I can focus on becoming a good sports presenter stroke journalist. So it was like learning a new trade, but I already had some of the tools in the bag to help me do that. So it, it was, it was hard at first. You kind of had to win people over a little bit oh. and, and just prove you're not just a kid's presenter. You get, particularly with Blue Peter, you get very pigeonholed. True. You know, I still, even though I left the programme in 2005, you know, still people will go, oh, I used to watch you on Blue Peter. You know, I get a lot saying, obviously, the Sky Sports stuff as well, but you do get pigeonholed. And I think it, it took a while for people to take me kind of seriously and realise, actually, he's, he could be quite good at this. Now, we, again, we as viewers only see the finished product, of course, on TV and 
everybody's looking great. But how much research and work did you have to put into the programs before you actually went live and presented them? Well, I can, I can tell you sort of recently, I've gone back to doing some live football. So I presented some games for Amazon uh, over Christmas and then a few games into the new year. And really the way I prepared for those games was no different to what I, what I did at Sky. And, and really, I mean, research, hard work, preparation is your best friend because it's, it's that famous saying, you know, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Um, and live TV, live sports broadcasting, where you're, you know, ultimately you sit down there and the story of that game is, is about to unfold and it could go in any direction. So you've got to prepare for everything. So if, my, if I had a game on a Saturday, probably by, you know, obviously make sure every day you're reading uh, as many of the sports pages as you can, just seeing what the various opinions are on, on the teams you're about to cover at the weekend and others. And by the Wednesday, you get what was called a stat pack, which for a Premier League game is around about 60 pages long. And it's got history of the clubs, the head-to-head records, their current form, and then big biographies on every single player. Wow. And you then begin to pick out, I make my own then two stat sheets. I pick out the information I think I'm most likely going to need. And then by the Thursday, you're probably having a, a phone call. I mean, it used to be back in the day when we could actually go into offices. You'd go into the office at Sky, you'd sit down with your producer and you'd go through the way you want that hour long build up to look. What are the key talking points? You know, what are we going to get out of the guests we've got this weekend? And then probably by the Friday, once I knew what the running order was for a game on a Saturday, then I'd write my script and, and work out what are going to be the best words that are going to describe what this this game means uh how big it is for the players how big it is for the fans um and then you probably used to get about two hours rehearsal on the day maybe not even that actually and you get to the ground have a quick bit of breakfast it was a lunchtime game on a saturday and then get into the studio at about 11 o'clock uh, go through everything then wait for the team news which literally came 15 minutes before you went on air and then at half 11 you you were on air so that's that's what would go into every single game now, you mentioned opinions, of course, on Sky, and we have lots of people with opinions, pundits, what have you. Have you ever had to, uh, say, come between two pundits when they disagree on their opinions? Right. Sorry, can you just say that again? Have you ever had to come between two pundits? Um, I wouldn't say come between. I mean, I, yeah, I, it's that's the best telly when it gets heated. You know, yes. that's, that's what you want in pundits. You don't want people who just, you know just tell you the obvious. You want to know why that's happened and why you're unhappy about that decision that was made. And it's really good telly when someone comes back at them and says, well, I, I, I actually don't see it like that. I mean, Graham Souness is, you know, it can be quite quite an advers- adversary in the studio. You know, he'll, he'll take people on and, you know, him and Jamie Carragher, who I did a number of games with, would sometimes come to blow. And they both used to play for Liverpool, yep. but they would disagree on stuff. But that as a presenter is a joy because you that's what you want. That's what yeah, people remember. It's just as long as the points they're making are good ones and actually valid and not just getting annoyed for the sake of it. But that you always wanted moments like that. And have you ever, ever worked with Roy Keane? Uh, no, I have. I, I missed Mr. Roy Keane. He's, he came <laughs> after I'd left, but I'd, I've often wondered what he'd be like to work with. Now, of course, you moved into this new new job. It's a, a whole new ballgame, as we said. There's lots more money, lots more stars, and there's even more fame. And um, how did you manage to, you know, your Christian life in that? How difficult was it to be Christian in that kind of an atmosphere? Yeah, it's it's it's... It's not, it's, not, it's not easy, but it's not easy for lots of us in, in lots of secular settings, wherever we're, we're doing our work or, or spending our days. And, you know, it, it is quite a macho world. Mm-hmm. Um, faith is not something that within this country, players are that comfortable about talking about. But then you look at some of the South Americans and they're very... They're very vocal and very, you know, expressive with their faith on the pitch. You sometimes see it when they score goals. Um, Brazilians in particular, yes. Yeah, exactly. So it's not yet yeah, not an easy place, I would say, to be a Christian. Um, you know, I'd, I'd sometimes find, you know, the language that was used, not not obviously when we were on air, but around kind of games, the banter, as they used to call it, sometimes you'd find it a little bit difficult. But it's about how you manage yourselves in those situations and, and not to find yourself being dragged into it because it's, it's easier to fit in than, than, than not. And that was always something I tried to do was like, the easiest thing to do is just go along with the flow, just be one of the boys, one of the lads. Mm-hmm. That way you fit in quicker, but actually that means compromising mm-hmm. because you're starting to then engage in conversations that aren't particularly, you know, Christian, they aren't particularly 
you know, pleasing to God. So that that was always the challenge, just trying to not get too involved in the the sort of banter that, that accompanies a lot of dressing rooms, which our dressing room obviously was the studio. Yeah. And was there many, many temptations in, in that kind of lifestyle as well that came with it? Um, no, not really. I mean, it's just, I, I think because the whole way through, I, the, I saw fame as, as, as being a fairly empty thing, a vacuous thing anyway. And I never saw myself really in terms, I always knew that when you did a live game, there's not a single football fan in the country who's tuning into that game because you're presenting it. They're tuning in because they want to watch the game. You know, even the great Des Lynham, who was my hero growing up in terms of television presenters, you know, no one tuned in to see Des. They loved Des and he was brilliant, but they, you would tune in because that's a game I want to watch today. Yeah. I think once you realise that, that no one's tuning in to look at you, they, it's almost you are doing your job the best when people don't really notice you. They tend to notice you when you make a mistake and that gets very public. But that's, that's the secret to not letting it swell your ego and, and, and put you in places where life becomes very different. It's, it's about seeing it for what it is. And I just saw myself as just someone there to facilitate getting on air, making it a really good watch, but ultimately we're about the game. Just going back to the early question about when somebody said to you about, you know, we need more Christians in media. Did you meet many Christians in, in the media as you were going through your career? Yeah, yeah, quite a few. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they, I mean, there was a, a kind of Christian union within the BBC. I just, I can never really go because it always met on day when I was very rarely at the BBC, but yeah, yeah, there were, I used to meet quite a few. I had a, quite a number of Christian friends at Sky, which was good. You know, they were always nice. You know, good to be able to chat to them. Uh, and I hate saying because they were one of us, but you know what I mean. Going, I, yeah. I know I can, I can chat about this to them because they understand. So yeah. that that was that was. I found that really helpful. And my closest friend Julia, who um, she was with Sky for years, and she's really really good friends of both myself and Darina. You know, she she was such a great support because I worked with her a lot, and knowing that she was a Christian as well, it just yeah, it was always a huge encouragement. Yeah, excellent. Now, of course, um, of all the sports you've covered, and um, what is your favourite, your own favourite sport? Well, it is football. I mean, I, I, I love a lot of sport. If I had to say you can only ever watch one for the rest of your life, then, then it, would be, it would be football. But I love, I love cricket and rugby and, and athletics. But um, football's the main one. Would that be Norwich City by any chance? Yes, it would. Well, good research, George. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, uh, you're better than I am. I'm a son of the support. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yes, oh, gosh, is right. <laughs> now, of course, you're at the height of your career. Everything was going well for you. But, of course... A couple of years ago, things changed a little bit. Okay? There was a tragedy that happened. Can you, would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I can, yeah, I can um, talk about it. It's, um, it's now three, three and a half years ago. Um, so it was the, the autumn of 2017. And yeah, everything life-wise was going well. I was second year of doing the Premier League. So I'd done the Football League for many years for Sky and then got got up to the top and got to do the Premier League. So I was into the second season. Really, really enjoying it, really enjoying it. Um, my boy Ethan was, he was eight at the time. And just had this very weird autumn period um, where I, I began to get struck down by some mental health issues. I'd had depression once before in my life, but I began to really struggle quite badly with anxiety. Um, and it really came out of nowhere. I just remember waking up one morning and I was doing a a show in the evening for Sky called The Debate, which was just a, an hour long show where you debate the main kind of football talking points of the day. And we all would have to do one of these a week. But a very simple show, you know, if you're an experienced broadcaster, there's nothing to get worried about. You've just got two football players there who can talk for England and on you go with it. But I just woke up and felt this real anxious feeling in the stomach. You know, that, that feeling you might get before a really important exam, kind of that knot in anxiety. And that started to become a really regular thing. Any time I was doing any work, this anxiety used to come in. And yet I'd never have a problem. You know, I'd, I've done playoff finals in the championship. You know, I've done big games in the Premier League. And yeah, there'd be that healthy adrenaline kick when you go on air, but no anxiety at all. But suddenly everything was becoming very anxious. And then into that came panic attacks. I started to have panic attacks quite regularly before games. Um, and so by late October of 2017, it, the decision was made to take me away from um, the studio for a while to, to get some help, 
to overcome these problems because they, they just became debilitating. Anybody watching this who's dealt with mental health problems will know that one of the things that anxiety or depression or panic attacks do is they make what was once totally possible feel impossible. So your work that you've done for the best part of 10, 11 years with Sky now feels like your enemy. Something that you could almost do in your sleep is now like scaling Mount Everest. Um, so I was taken out of the firing line. And then amidst all that, so I was sort of getting getting some professional counseling. I was, I did go down the medication route. So it was all about trying to get me better. And then amidst all that, my late wife, Gemma, um, started to develop these headaches um, that became, became ever more increasing and, and longer. And we started to do, and she had fatigue. And so we did some trips to the doctors and they, they felt it was all wrapped up in the stress of seeing me like I was. Um, and then everything kind of just developed very quickly over a, a week. Um, she went into accident emergency on a Monday night in Reading where we lived at the time. And by the Tuesday, she's been diagnosed with, thankfully it's a, it's a rare form of blood cancer, but it's called acute myeloid leukemia. Um, which develops very, very rapidly. They, they felt at the time she may have only had it for four to five weeks. So that's wow. how quickly it, it develops. And the, the difficulty with blood cancer is that symptoms can often be very varied. So picking up on it is not always easy. Um, and then due to a complication that occurred by the end of the week, um, she, she'd gone and she was, she was only 40. So yeah, in the space of a very, very, small amount of time you your world's been turned on its axis uh, and everything everything's changed and how did you manage to cope with all that tragedy at one time and how did you manage to uh, get the message across to your son ethan well it was i mean he in the early stages was the single biggest reason why you you have to get on with it and you know i i i, I was a mess for quite a long time you know it's something like this can't fail to affect you. So I, I really got through that period through, through him, but also just having an incredibly amazing supportive group of family and friends who kind of carried me and him through those first few weeks and months. Um, it, it, was, it, was, it was a really, really tough period. You know, everything that felt certain now feels incredibly uncertain it's a very fear-filled time mm -hmm. and a time when you're questioning everything you're questioning god you're questioning what on earth is this faith all about you know where are you god in all this everything's coming at you at a million miles an hour um it, yeah it's a it's a really really difficult thing to go through and how's ethan, ethan doing now at the moment he's he's amazing actually he's just such a yeah, I, I often say this is that if you if you looked at him in the playground and said, pick out the kid who's lost his mum at the age of eight, I, I would I bet a decent amount of money people would struggle to pick him out unless they actually asked him. He's very, very happy. And I think a lot of that security. So I've I've um, been with Darina now for two years and she has she's been such a, an amazing figure in my life. I love it to bits, but she's she's been remarkable with Ethan. So she's, you know, when a, when a kid goes through something like this, essentially everything that felt sh like a sure foundation feels like it's shaking. And they become very, very worried about you, as in the surviving parent, because they look at you mm -hmm. and they know deep down, if something happens to you, they have no parents left. It's a, it's a horrible thing to say, but it's the truth. It is reality. So he, he needed security and she's provided so much of that for him and, and and you know loving a child who's not your own is it's hard it is hard but she has just been full of grace and love and compassion and she's I'd say you know I've you know I've obviously helped a little bit and God's helped massively but you know to see him now embracing life and enjoying it and see that smile on his face yeah there's always going to be that pain there there's all that pain will always be there for him uh, and it will travel with him for the rest of his days but that doesn't mean you can't still embrace life. And I, I think this came very early on where I, I worked out what this probably life would be like for him going forward. And he, we were, as I said, so well supported by so many people, but like the world of football was just amazing. I remember getting a really powerful, very touching letter from Maurizio Pochettino, who was the Spurs boss at the time, you know, written himself. It wasn't one of those club generated letters with a computerized signature. That's just a lovely letter. I didn't really know the bloke. I'd seen, seen him a couple of times to say hello to at White Hart Lane. 
Uh, and then in the March of 2018, so a few months later, the, the FA got in touch and said, would Ethan like to be a, a, an England mascot for the game against Italy in a few weeks' time? I was like, yeah, I would love that. And I remember that night when this, this kind of really struck me. So, you know, just seeing Ethan walk out and just the look on his face as he emerged from that tunnel, because I was, I was very lucky. I was able to stand right by the tunnel as he came out. And I could watch him standing there on the halfway line as the, the anthems went out and just looking and looking around this... Those are the days where we could have fans in the stadiums, like all of them. So there's 90,000 fans there. And just an amazing moment, just, uh, just full of such pride for him. Uh, and we got back in the car later that night. He's very, very tired. He's still in his England kit. And just before he dropped off, I said, I said, how was that? How was it? He said, oh, he said, oh, it's just amazing. It's just, it's, it was, he said, it's the most amazing thing I've done. And he said, but I just feel so sad that mummy wasn't here to see it. And I think in that moment, I understood really for him what life will be like going forward. Yeah. And that is that there's going to be two things traveling together through his life, which is the joy of experiences like that. The joy of, you know, being able to go on holiday, whatever it might be, the joy of hanging out with his cousins. But alongside that will always be that pain of, of the loss of his mum. And I think once you, you get that into your head, you begin to understand how you can move forward in life. Um, but also move forward for him without forgetting what came before. Excellent. Now, you've done some writing about the, uh, the blood book for blood cancer, also some blog. You've written a book as well. Tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah, so the book's called um, Love Interrupts. I wrote it it's three years ago now. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's been, a, been quite a while. But I just, I just wanted to write down, just, just be really honest about what this was like and to not really kind of pull any punches uh, I think I think if I wrote it now it would be a quite different book um but it's quite raw and I you know a number of people have said to me I, I found it a really difficult read but it was never supposed to be an easy read mm -hmm. it's just an honest account of what it was like for us in the knowledge that thousands of people go through this and obviously so sadly in the last 15 months We've seen how many people have been affected by grief because of COVID. Yeah, this is just our story, but I just wanted to be honest about what it was like, but also honest about my faith. You know, I didn't, I didn't want it to be just a Christian book that would only end up in Christian bookshops. I wanted it to be a secular book mm -hmm. but with my faith woven throughout it and, and to be able to tell stories of those days in which I would question where God is in all this. So it's just a raw, honest account of really that first year. Um, and I wanted it to be a book that, that did end on a note of hope. Um, and, and it does, you know, and so that it's, it's painful, but it's also, it's also hope filled by the end. Excellent. So is that book available on Amazon? It certainly is. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Of course, uh, thank you so much for giving the time. What does the future hold for you now in the family? Uh, are you going to go back to broadcasting and that, or you think? Well, hopefully I'll do some more games for, for Amazon later in the year. Um, and I, I do, I really enjoy one thing I do at the moment. Well, I, I do a podcast series called Life Interrupted. And I do it with an organisation called Global, who are the kind of the biggest global, it's not the biggest global, biggest commercial radio station owner in the country. So they look after Classic FM, LBC, Capital, Heart, you name it, they have a really big podcast wing. So I've done two series of Life Interrupted, which I absolutely love doing. And basically I speak to men and women, known and unknown, who've gone through something life-changing. Now it might, be, it might be an injury. Like the other week, he's coming out in the next series, series three. I, I um, interviewed James Taylor. Um, now he might not be a name familiar to a lot of people, but for cricket fans, they will remember James. And he was a really, yeah. What about the singer, James Taylor? <laughs> yeah, <not> that one. <laughs> but James is a really talented cricketer. He was captain Nottinghamshire. He just uh, he made a thing around about thirty appearances for England by this stage. He's in his young twenties. You know, he's got the cricketing world before him. He's got a potentially a really long career ahead of him and a really glittering one, I think. And then on a very cold spring day, uh, a warm-up game for Nottinghamshire against Cambridge University, he just gets this searing chest pain and collapses and wow. minutes later is fighting for his life in the, the changing room. Uh, and many days later, I mean, wired up to a machine in hospital, he finds out that he has this heart condition that was previously undetected. And the doctor says to him, you, if you ever exercise again, if you ever play the game of cricket again, you will almost certainly die. So he's had to have like a defibrillator fitted. So this is a guy who in one moment on a cold morning in the spring of that year, 
his life is interrupted and everything changes. But well, the life that, that James has gone on to lead, the dark days he went through in terms of what this meant to have his dream, his cricketing career snatched away from him in a moment. And then to begin to rebuild, pull himself through the dark days. And then to hear in his voice, the kind of humor and the, and the zest for life that he has now and the kind of life he's leading that, yeah, it's so different to the life he would have had. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, the, the whole idea of the podcast is to hear those kind of stories, but just at the end of them, to people feel really kind of instilled with a sense of hope that actually whatever you go through in life, there is always, as we often call it on the series, the narrow way through. And it's been a narrow way through for James. And it's been a narrow way through for countless other people I've spoken to on the podcast. But I've, I, I love doing it. It's, I'm, I'm, I so often get to the end of it. I'm just really, really blown away. And inspired myself. I've learned a huge amount from from the people I've spoken to. I've got two more short questions for you. Okay, uh, before you finish your uh, course of season broadcaster, have you got any tips for a young up and coming broadcaster like myself? <laughs> well, the thing is, George, unlike when I was trying to get into TV, <laughs> the world is your oyster because all of us now can broadcast ourselves. You know, you yeah. could sit there and in the next half an hour, you, I don't know, you may have one, you could create your own YouTube channel. Yeah. Now, obviously, getting subscribers to that YouTube channel, that's the challenge. Can you find the content? Can you make something that's original? Are you good in front of a camera? Are you going to engage with people? But the actual doing it, it's available to everyone. So I say to young people now who say, you know, how am I going to get into sports? I said, just start now. You know, you've got a phone that will record really good quality correct, audio. Yeah. Get yourself down. When, once we're allowed back in, if you want to be a football commentator, get yourself down to your local football club and just commentate on it. Mm-hmm. And maybe find out if there's a local radio station. You know, just as, It's always about just using what's there. And there's so many opportunities. What it does, of course, mean, though, is the competition has never been higher because there's so many people out there who can set up an Instagram account and maybe do Instagram TV clips or whatever it might be. There's an awful lot of people doing it. So, you know, rising to the top has never been more challenging than it is right now. But the exciting thing is never has there been more opportunity and ability to start right now, you know, in terms of, of, of learning how to broadcast, learning how to present. So that would be what I say, just, just do as much as you possibly can. So on the day that interview comes with a TV station or maybe a radio station or a newspaper, whatever the, the line you wanna go down, that when you sit there, you know that in front of them is something that speaks to them, that this isn't something you just woke up yesterday morning for, I fancy a try at this. Actually, you've been doing something about it for the last three years. Uh, and you know, and you you are serious about this. So I would say, people get on, get experience now. Start broadcasting. Start writing articles. Whatever it is you want to do, don't wait for the job. Just get going now. I'm on it, Simon. I'll start in the morning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, one final question, which I ask all my uh, the uh, people who come on here: um, of all the decisions you made in your life, what was the best decision you ever made? That is a that is an excellent excellent question. Um, I think because of where it's led me, um, I think the best decision I ever made was that day back in Beckles was to pray about my future. I know people might say, well, so much else has happened, but actually it, it was the anchor point over those next three and a half years, because I set myself three years, but actually God's timing is often quite different to ours. And actually it was three and a half years. And actually it came at a moment where I've kind of given up on it. But all those times I nearly walked away from the dream, I would always think back to that day. I'd think back to the fact that I prayed to God and said, please, God, give me a sign that this is the way you want me to go. It might not end up being the program I think it's going to be, but that I'm not wasting the rest of my day, you know, the next three years of my life chasing a dream that's never going to come off. And that day he answered that prayer. So all those times where I doubted whether I'd ever make it, I would come back to that day and go, that was the best decision ever because I think if I did, wasn't able to look back on that day and go, that's how God answered that prayer. He spoke to me directly about getting into the media that I may well have walked away and totally given up on it and may have ended up working selfishly for the rest of my life. I just don't know. But that for me, because of everything that led from it was the best decision to take it to God first. Thank you, Sam. It's been fantastic speaking to you for, for being very honest and open. And uh, thank you for your tips as well, of course. And, uh, uh, with that, I'll hand back to Alan. Thank you, Alan. Cheers, George. Okay. Thank you, George. And thank you, Simon. You are a very busy man. We appreciate you giving your time to, to come and share tonight with us. 
And we do thank you for such an uh, interesting story of a, a, a really a life of adventure. But you've also had your challenges as well. But through it all, God has been there with you. And there are many people watching tonight, and we'll watch in the future on uh, live on YouTube and on Facebook. You'll watch this story. And I want to give you that hope that Simon talked about. Now, there is a hope. The hope if you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says we're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. But Jesus came and he died on a cross in your place. He paid the punishment for your sins and mine. And all he wants you to do is acknowledge that you are a sinner and believe that he died in your place. Invite him to come into your heart, into your life. And if you do, you will receive the free gift of eternal life. It's the most wonderful thing. And you will find that God will be there. Like Simon said, he's called out to God. He's asked God in prayer. And God's answered his prayers. And God loves you so much. He wants you to have a personal relationship with him. So what I'm going to do is say a simple prayer. And if you would like to pray this prayer with me, you can have that same relationship with, with God. Just pray with me right now. Lord Jesus Christ, I come to you now. I confess that I am a sinner because the Bible says we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God, and that includes me. But I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross in my place, taking the punishment for my sins, and you poured out your precious blood to wash my sins away. I repent of my sins. I turn away from them. I turn to you with all my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come into my life right now by your spirit and give to me the free gift of eternal life. I receive you now. Thank you for coming into my life. Now I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead. And I thank you, Lord, for saving me, for making me a child of God. Help me from this day forward to follow you, to serve you. Help me to get to know you more and more. And then one day, I look forward to being with you in your heavenly kingdom. Amen. If you prayed that prayer tonight, please contact us on our number. You can see on the screen, plus four four seven nine four three five five zero two eight seven. You can also go to our website, which is lifestoriesworldwide.com. There you will find the salvation prayer link. You can link onto You can click onto that. But please let us know. If you have any needs, contact us on that number, either phone, WhatsApp, or text that number. And someone will get back to you as soon as possible to give you help. So thanks again, Simon, for a wonderful evening. But there's one request came to me today, and that's, um, one of the colleagues of my son uh, asked him, would, would he pray for uh, his, her mother and father? And she said, um, her mother got up in the night last night and fell downstairs. She's in hospital, very bandaged up, and her husband is very concerned. And the names are Christine and Fred Unsworth. And Simon, I'm going to ask you if you would pray for Christine Unsworth, who fell downstairs, and for her husband, Fred, who's very concerned for her. That's Christine and Fred Unsworth, please. Father God, we pray for Christine and Fred right now, and we just pray for uh, an alleviating, alleviation of the pain. Uh, we pray for healing, and we pray um, that neither of them would be filled with fear about what this means going forward. We just pray that you'd surround them with the right people, uh, give them the right paths to get the right kind of help. And Father, I just pray that amidst everything they're going through right now and the anxious time that they're in the midst of, 
that they would know uh, that you are with them, that you stand with them in this place and you will carry them through. And even though there may be times when you feel quiet and it feels like you're not there, that the reality is you, you never ever leave our side. So I pray that they would just know that fatherly love and compassion and care for them in their lives, just particularly tonight. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Simon. Thanks again for sharing. And all the people who've been watching, thank you for joining us tonight. And you will be able to watch Simon's story again. You can contact us through our website and you'll be able to watch Simon's story. Pass it on, please. Pass this wonderful story on to your friends. And let me invite you again to join us next Monday at 8 o'clock for Life Stories Worldwide. Next week, we have a young man called Luca Berridge. I met this young man in Georgia, in the Caucasus, uh, a couple of years ago, and he shared his story, which is an amazing story. He was born into a Muslim family. His great-grandfather was the, the chief imam of the Ajama region of Georgia. His grandfather was also an imam. But Luke had an amazing experience. He had a vision, and a vision that changed his life. And he'll be sharing next Monday what has happened to him since he had this vision. So please join us next Monday at 8 o'clock on, on Zoom, on Facebook, and on YouTube. And please let me remind you that every lunchtime, 12 o'clock, there's Life Stories TV. You can watch that on lunch, Life Stories at lunch. And you can find all the information about all the work that we're doing on lifestoriesworldwide.com. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you again, Simon. It's been wonderful. We appreciate you giving your time. Thank you, George, for your interviewing. I don't know whether there's a future for you in, you, in, in <laughs> for you in this. Uh, I know you're asking Simon about it, uh, but uh, maybe there is. And we pray God's blessing on you, Simon, for the future. We pray he'll guide you and direct you and bless you and Ethan Law in all that you do. God bless you all. And thank you all for being with us tonight.